The, the first, I mean, the thing about membership, you, you've, both, you've both been attentive to this as best you can, is that, um, you know, I know it depends on work schedules and that kind of thing, but, um, you know, well, we'll talk about it. I mean, you want to be a member of the congregation. That means you can look at it two different ways, and this is where God's Word can be a little bit challenging for us because it speaks in two ways. Right? We've talked about this. You, you, can, you can listen to the Word of, of the law, which says, Thou shalt and thou shalt not, right? which uh, that's always kind of oppressive because it accuses, right? So in that case, Jesus says, go to church, third commandment. Remember the Sabbath, you heard this in chapel, right? <laughs> uh, for better, for worse, some of the children were really struggling with that, right? And brought up things that, uh, and then I responded to that I probably shouldn't have, but sometimes it's hard to re realize in the moment, this is probably something I shouldn't answer, <laughs> you know, because they just, they just talk. They don't have any restraint. I like open mm -hmm. yeah. doors, though. Yeah. That's yeah, I, no, I think so. I think so. I mean, I'd like to have that relationship with people where they're not ashamed to have conversations about anything, really. But, um, but that can, you have to let your guard down and there has to be trust there, right? The children trust you. Hmm. The parents don't necessarily. So, um, because they didn't get to be there. They didn't know what happened. They don't, yeah. Anyway, so you can go about the law and that, and that accuses us and says, you know, you must be in church every Sunday and that kind of thing. Um, but when we talk about that word of law, Paul's very clear in Galatians that all the, all the thou shalt and thou shalt nots are given not because that's God just telling us how to live, although it does do that, but it's to show us how we, by nature, actually don't want to be Christians effectively. <laughs> that's, that's how we are. And that the fact that we're Christians is by his giving. It's a gift to us. So, um, so it's both to accuse, but also to restrain us. And... But then uh, what we actually define the law as, Ten Commandments would be just like the, the epitome, the small bit version of it. Um, we call those God's alien work, which I always like to talk about aliens, not little green men, but like, or his foreign work. It's the thing that, you know, this as parents, you have to say things. Mysterious. No, 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 it's different than that. No, the things that you have to say sometimes that you'd rather not say, you know, or the discipline that you have to meet out. And you, you love the child, and so... You, and you don't want to hurt and harm them, and of course that's not what you're doing, but yet you still need to discipline them for their good so that to turn them away from the direction they're going back towards the path, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's not easy, and it's hard, and, and I don't think God takes any joy in it either, mm -hmm. right? And um, sometimes people paint that picture of, of God when he, when he speaks word of law or judgment as being like, mass, or not mass, like sadist, like he's trying to hurt, hurt us. He, and he delights in pain. Yeah, he delights in pain or something. It's like, no, 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 no. That's only just to, to, to expose the flaws or the, the weakness or the, or the theological word is the sin. So um, that's not the way that we want to think about um, what we've been doing, you know, catechesis, although we took some time off, um, or just going to church in general or listening, uh, you know, in chapel each morning or whatever the context is where God's word is being preached or taught or delivered through gifts. They're not, it's, it, they're gifts. That's actually the word that I wanted to get to, that it's a blessing to us. Um, and yeah, at the same time though, we struggle against it because, you know, our priorities aren't always lined up with his and We're human. yeah, yeah. We want to be careful about saying that. I think it's right, but that can be an excuse to just like do whatever you want, but we really are. But we really are. We really are. Right, we really are. And just read the what Bible. What you want to do is spend time with God's mm -hmm. word and mm -hmm. make us feel good. I always yeah. feel good. Yeah, and just enjoy it. Well, it doesn't necessarily always make you feel good. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's not always good for you. Right, exactly. Even if it doesn't always make you feel good. best. Well, I suppose. No, in, in the best possible sense. Yeah, in the best possible way. Right. Like. Well, sometimes it's bitter medicine, right? But it's still medicine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's different ways to talk about it. And so I, what I hope is that um, what, we're, what we've been working towards is actually, you know, for, the, for joy and delight and, and for peace. Um, and that, you're, that your hope and your comfort and your joy and your peace are not placed in yourself, but placed in what God has said and what he gives. Um, and and the, 
but that it's really kind of a mindset thing, I suppose, right? That you, you shift your thinking and thinking, I need to do things to make God happy with me, but instead saying, God is happy with me, and because he's happy with me, he has things for me, and he wants what's best for me, and he wants to guide me and instruct me. Being able to, if you are able to go to church and catechism and chapel, and... Just keep listing all the things. Yeah. <laughs> over and over again, all the catechism is actually finished. Yeah, yeah. So, um, oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Right. Start, right. Yeah, exactly. That's fine. Yeah. Right. When you pointed out something very helpful, which is that not everyone is at the same place all at once, right. and um, it's connected a little bit to the sermon today, is that. We have the promise, you know, that all will be raised from the dead. All will receive the gift of eternal life. All will be made um, whole again, whatever that is. You know, only God knows actually what the whole version of us looks like. Because <laughs> it's in his mind. and was in his mind's eye from even before he made us. And yet because of sin, we don't, we don't even really know who we are or who we will be exactly, right? Um, we'd like to know what our, the best version of ourselves is. But um, I think it's actually better than what we can imagine. So, um, so, so we have that hope, and then um, some Christians, we talked about this approach, it is like the whole, our whole life is trying to get closer to that, and then like our death and resurrection is just like the final bit. Um, I think it's more the other direction. I don't know. There's different ways to talk about it, whereas our whole life we come to realize more and more our need for that death and resurrection, and, um, and so our life isn't exactly progressing upward, but it's more progressing um, towards God. Yeah, it feels like Mm-hmm. Well, I hope so. Blessings and yeah. grace, they have these nice words associated because it does feel like, but you're, I think you're, I agree with you that we're just progressing closer and closer to death, which is closer and closer to God. That sounds a little negative, but. So, but <laughs> I love the idea of dying. I'm not scared True. of it at all. Right, right. And that's, yeah. and that's the key is that, is that no matter whether, you know, it seems like. Um, that you found a place where, where you have like greater self-control and discipline and patience and kindness. Uh, and that's by God's giving, of course, to the Holy Spirit. That's the promise of the Holy Spirit. Um, at the same time, if that all gets taken away from you in a moment because of some tragedy or something that you did or whatever, that you still have the promise that, and that it's not like you can't, that you ever lost that. Yeah. yeah. So this is connected to um, confirmation And were you confirmed previously in the Roman church? Okay. So confirmation is a right of the church. It's not for the Roman church. Um, It's considered a sacrament for for the Roman Catholic church. Yeah. And um, uh, the definition of sacrament differs between different traditions, even amongst Roman Catholics. We kind of follow the Augustinian definition, St. Augustine, um, which is that it's a word word of God attached to physical means. That was Augustine's definition. And uh, so, for example, baptism is a sacrament because the word of God, the promise there is that it makes you a child of God, gives you forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the resurrection. That's all attached to the water. The water isn't the thing that does it, but we use water because God said to use water as a sign of the word that is spoken. But it's the word that does it. Same thing with the Lord's Supper. It's not the bread and wine that makes it the Lord's Supper. Right? It's the word of God attached to it. This is my body. This is my blood. This is why we actually don't really care so much about the bread and the wine, as far as like what color the wine is or how tasty the bread is, although I don't understand why we use not tasty bread. That doesn't make any sense to me. But <laughs> that's, the way it is. that's the way it is. Well, I understand the unleavened bread connection because that's to the manna in the wilderness. Yeah, and, and to the Passover bread, which was also unleavened. Remember, they, they had to quickly get out of Egypt, so they didn't have time to ri- rise the bread, so no leavening. And then the manna also was kind of the white flake-like thing. So we kind of combine those two things and say it's unleavened and it's fine and flaky. Anyway. <laughs> it tastes like cardboard. It tastes like cardboard. Oh. Hmm. This is really Mm-hmm. We went and visited a place that made them. Oh, beautiful. Which was 
to me, that was pretty cool. Yeah. I just see how it was made and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And some, um, some churches have traditions like, like those um, youth that are in catechesis will, for Maundy Thursday, bake the bread. Mm-hmm. Generally, we don't use, we'll just buy some bread that's been baked for that purpose, right? Sacramental thing. The different church supply places have it. It's kind of... But I haven't, no. But they will. But but the problem, it it gets a little messy. Is kind of the the biggest just kind of complaint about it. Yeah, because you end up with crumbs, and then what do you do with the crumb, and how do you clean up it? It's kind of. No, no. I think no. I it, no. It could be. No, it could be. It could be that. Um, but it's also there's a degree of piety there. Is that like we try to treat? Yeah, we try to treat, and we try to dispose of it reverently, whatever's left. Right? Like, typically I just eat what's left and drink. Well, it's because most, because we believe that Christ gives us his body and blood in, in with and under the bread and wine. Um, we don't really know, like, when did it become the bread and wine? When did it stop become a body and blood? Or when was it, like, so we just don't act like we know. That's kind of the best practice, I think, um, amongst Christians generally. It's just to say, uh, like the Roman Catholics would say, it never stops being body and blood once it's consecrated. Um, we don't go that far, although we act like it is still. And so we, we don't like pour the wine down the drain. We pour it out on the ground, this kind of thing. That's just irresponsible. Yeah, and we just, well, you're not trying, well, you're just trying not to offend consciences is the key. It's like, um, and it's the same thing with the vessels that we use. I mean, it's glass and s- silver and it's like. By the way, I mean, you drink from Okay. Good. I just I'd like to know. So yeah. Like, yeah, the individual cups is, it's not a, um, it's a relatively recent practice. Depends on the congregation. It started to come around in the 50s and 60s. Uh, it really took off in the 80s with the AIDS crisis. Because oh, yeah. people thought they were going to get AIDS by like yeah. spit or something. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. COVID, it rose also. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's an article on our website somewhere because <laughs> I posted it. Uh, from a medical doctor who reviewed all the literature. And um, almost always um, the chalice, the cup, is silver. And the reason for that is the uh, antimicrobial. Oh, yes. Even if that wasn't originally the reason, it turns out that that's a side benefit. There are There are no no documented cases of disease transmission from receiving the cup in English literature. There's no, none. Not maybe because they never studied it, or maybe because it doesn't happen. Um, I prefer to go with the latter. <laughs> it's not something to be worried about. It was a big deal. No. Well, and we do also. I have, I have to think that viral colds and stuff like that are much easier transferred. Oh, air. Um, well, on the cup, though, too, versus a disease. You would think. You, you would know? think. I mean, and, and, and I mean, think. I think that's more what people are worried about. I mean, if. Mm-hmm. You know, mine is complete parametric pressure change right now. And right, I hear it. To do with anything else but that. But Three years ago, they said you had COVID. Right, right exactly. <laughs> exactly. But people that come in coughing and sneezing or whatever, please take the individual cup. Right? You know what yeah. I mean? And I'm not trying to be mean. <laughs> I don't want to get what you have. Right, so. So you've hit on an important topic. I don't know. We maybe haven't talked about this, so it's worth mentioning. Is that. Um, we mentioned the law, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Um, also, even the, the gospel, the forgiveness of sins, is attached to particular things, right? So, so like we said with baptism, we use water. We don't use, like, say, baptism without water. It's not baptism without water. That's even, the word just means to wash with water. So if and only for that reason, you have to use water, right? There's not another kind of baptism. Um, same thing with the Lord's Supper. He, he takes the bread, he takes the wine. There wasn't grape juice. That was pasteurization. Thank Louis Pasteur for that. Um, we don't want to be drunkards, so you don't drink so much that makes you drunk, that of course, because that, that's prohibited too. But we, we do, when, when uh, Jesus says do this, we do this, <laughs> right? Because it's a command. It's a command that gives a blessing, but it's still a command, right? So if he says do it this way, we do it this way. If he says sing, we sing. If he says pray, we pray, right? He says pray this way, Lord's Prayer. So we pray the Lord's Prayer. It doesn't mean we can't pray other prayers, right? But we say it the way he told us to say it. Um, and then, of course, there's all the prohibitions, the things that we, that we aren't to, to, to engage in, right? To quote Paul. And then there's everything else. And what you're talking about with the chalice and the individual cups, 
I think most of our, 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 our churches um, think of that as that, that something else category. And we actually have a technical word for it. It's called adiaphora. It's a Latin word. It means things that are neither commanded nor forbidden. Yeah. Um, and so we do approach those things um, for the sake of the, the way that we think about those things is different. Not what has God said or what has he not said because he hasn't said. So actually by that standard then, what's best for Allie or what's best you know, for my neighbor, right? And like you said, I'm sneezing everywhere. Maybe I don't even receive the sacrament that they are asked the pastor to commune me separately just because I don't want to cause potential offense to others who are like, this person went up there and sneezed in the cup and now I can't receive it. Right. Yeah, and I would probably act on that, actually. I would probably drink the rest of it, clean it out, and then start over. Because I, I, I don't, I mean, I don't care. I, I'll, when you have small children, bodily fluids is just part of life. I'm nervous about Okay, so let's talk about that. Good, I wanted to do that. So again, nice segue. Do we have to, I have to do a, a mm-hmm. separate conversation yeah. for your okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's why I asked uh, whether you've been confirmed before. So a lot of what you're going to say is a repeat of what you said before. You're just saying it again. Yeah, well, there you go. So no problem saying it again. Well, on Friday, I, um, I did an uh, anniversary of a marriage, a renewal of vows. Mm-hmm. And, it's like, and they're like, we don't know. We're so nervous. And I'm like, you did this 30 years ago. You can't do it again. And they don't. That's exactly right. Right. So, so I mean, so it's, it's still profound to go back and. Well, and a lot of times you're so nervous and you've prepared so much for the. Oh, yeah. And yada, 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 that days of work. <laughs> so. All I remember is my glasses kept slipping down my nose because it was so, it was 95 degrees, no air conditioning. See? Yeah. I don't remember any of the things I said. All right. Um, except for like, I do now because. <laughs> You have to do it. Yeah. Uh, repeat after me. So, yeah. Right. Um, this is what's called an agenda. This is the pastor's book that has all the extra things that aren't in the hymnal. The right of confirmation is in the hymnal, but I just printed it out for you so I didn't have to go grab one. Um, but I want to share with you before we look at it um, what it is, because I think this will answer your question as to why you could do it again. Um, and this is different than, so this is different than the Roman church. Um, we retained it. Actually, for 200 years, we didn't have confirmation after the Reformation. And then it came back um, in the 19th century, so. Which happens sometimes. Like, we have to, you have to give up something for a while because it gets kind of, you get confused about what it is, and then you, maybe you can bring it back later and understand it rightly again. Confirmation is a, this isn't on your sheet. I'm just gonna read it to you. Confirmation is a custom of the church and not a sacrament. It links the catechumens, that's you, to their baptism, celebrates the reception of the Lord's word among them, so you've been in church, and in cases where the candidates have not yet communed, which is also true for you here, welcomes them to the Lord's table. Luther strongly urges in both catechisms that those who are unwilling to learn, at the very least, the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, uh, should not be admitted to the Lord's Supper. So we took the time to study those things. And you already knew the Lord's Prayer, but you probably knew the Creed too, right? Um, But we've looked at the Ten Commandments, and we've been doing it again in chapel, so you're getting it again. Um, And that's a key, right? Um, As with any learning, without repetition, you don't retain it. Like, if you don't ever, I don't use calculus anymore. I don't remember how to do any of it. But I was really, I was really great at it when I could do it. Oh, good for you. (laughs) Like, I tested out of all my college math, but then I, I couldn't tell you anything about it today, because I didn't retain it. Uh, baptized Christians are admitted to the sacrament when they have been examined and absolved by their pastor in accordance with the Lutheran custom outlined in Augsburg Confession, Article uh, 25, which I haven't read to you, but it's what we've been doing. I've asked you what do you believe, and you've told me what you believe as we've studied the catechism together. That's what we did. Confirmation declares of a catechumen that he or she is a Christian who has been baptized. How's that? You've been baptized. Yay! Yay. Nice. <laughs> Once. There's only one baptism. Oh. We say that in the creed, right? I don't know which one was the right one. Uh, confesses the faith, right? So you say the creed, and is in communion with Christ and his church. The reception of catechumens to the Lord's table assumes that ongoing catechesis is the way of life for the faithful Christian, right? So they, uh, whether it's with me in Bible study or um, you watch the daily prayer online or you pray with your family using the prayer guide that I give or, or some other resource even, um, that, uh, yeah, that ongoing 
learning. This is kind of different than I think a lot of churches, at least in my experience, is that they think, and this is a problem even for our own church, because once people are done with catechesis, like uh, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, whenever they finish, it used to be eighth grade, all, everybody was eighth grade, um, up until I came here, basically, I ruined it. I said, mm -hmm. well, I don't care what age you are, if you're capable of learning it and confessing it, then then I, your age is kind of arbitrary. That's, that's an education philosophy difference too. Like if you can do third grade math and you're in first grade, I don't care, do third grade math, just keep going. Um, it's the same thing with catechesis. And that's why we have some pretty advanced children, like in chapel, you've heard this, who like, they make all sorts of great theological co confession, connections, whatever, because they've been learning and I just let them keep going. <laughs> no, you don't have to hold you back. Uh, and because I was one of those students that was very bored in school because it was always like grade level. Anyway, so same thing here in the church is that we don't need to stop learning, um, but what we learn might change. And so I want, I want to encourage just regular listening. You hear what I hear? Mm -hmm. I have to, we have to work very hard to, re to keep her. We'll see. She's a Concordia student that oh, approached yeah. us to play organ. Yes. Right after catechism, but then to go with us. Too bad. Anyway, so what were you we saying? I was saying, oh yes, the rite of confirmation, which we'll read in a minute, emphasizes God's work in baptism, the gift of faith, and the benefits of the Lord's Supper for all who believe in Christ, and the words of his testament. All right? Uh, and it happens in the, just in the middle of the church, so between the sermon, the prayer, and the, and the Lord's Supper. So you'll be confirmed, and then you'll be welcome to the table. That's... That's the practice if you haven't already been receiving the supper, which is also an option, which most people don't take advantage of. But um, Roman Church has First Communion. We have for here for 15 years, and only like four people have took advantage of it in all that time. Well, mm -hmm. Having the Lord's Supper, confessing the faith, having the Lord's Supper, but not having gone through the full catechesis yet of, towards confirmation. So for most people in the church, 98, 99%, they went through... Th two or three years of cate catechism with the pastor, they were confirmed, and then they received the Lord's Supper. Okay. But that's not, there's no command from God that it has to be that way. Okay. And so our churches also have retained and, or reintroduced in most places like here, um, that a ch child who confesses the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the prayer, knows what baptism and Lord's Supper is, and it says it to the pastor, they can, that's examined, absolved, they can come to the table too even before they're confirmed. So you could do that okay. with the boys. My kids are probably going to do that because they're Yeah, yeah, because they'll get there, they'll get there so long before 6th, 7th, 8th grade. Right. Right. And then, like I said, there's no reason. Uh, my experience, this church, again, hasn't taken care of it, except for, or hasn't done that, with the exception of, uh, I think Leah did, my daughter. Um, but in my previous parish, um, I had a number of people, a number of children that did that. And they, it's going to sound kind of, like a wooey or a motive, but, but they actually changed. Their attitude towards what we were doing was totally different once they started receiving the sacrament. They were actually even more engaged and interested yeah. in what we were learning. Because they're part of it. Because they're part of it. Yeah, and I think that's right. You don't, we're not trying to exclude people from the Lord's Supper. I haven't tried to do that with you. Hopefully that's been clear from day one. But we wanted to be deliberate and, and do it in a way that, so that you receive it to your benefit. Um, and however long that takes. Right? Maybe it doesn't take very long, maybe it takes a while. So, like Dasha is coming from more of a zero, you know, an awareness of things. Her husband is nominally Lutheran, but that's, so it might take, it might take a little, like you said, we don't all have to get there at the same rate or speed. Well, we need baptism. I mean, that's the first point for her, right? She needs to be baptized. I don't think. Right? Right. So let's, we, we have steps. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you have the right in front of you. And so I'm just going to walk you through it. That way, uh, it's not crazy to you. I don't know if you have a day in mind yet. I can do it any Sunday that works. You, don't, you could do it together. You could do it separate. That's fine. Do you do it during mm -hmm. It's during church. Yep. Yeah, because... Um, uh, I'm not going up there alone. Okay. <laughs> what? Matt could go up with you. He did it. There could be, you can have a sponsor. You, oh, okay. Or if, you ha, if, you're, if your baptismal sponsors are still around, they could come, which is cool, because it's connected to your baptism. You know, they're older now, right? Did you have sponsors at baptism? Do you remember? You didn't have sponsors. Did, did you have baptismal sponsors, godparents? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, and again, you've already been confirmed. They, 
Yeah, and they've already done it. Yeah, figure out what, what works between the two of you and we'll, we'll do it. Beloved in the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, all authority, this is Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and, uh, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So that's one of our chief texts for baptism, right? Jesus sent his apostles with baptism and his word to be taught to the baptized, right? You, so then I just declare what's already true. You have been baptized and catechized in the Christian faith according to the Lord's bidding. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. There's a positive and a negative. <laughs> uh, but here, lift up your hearts, therefore, to the God of all grace and joyfully give answer to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. In other words, you're going to confess Jesus uh, before men, right, before people. And we don't, we don't do the gender neutral language, sorry. Uh, I know, we're just kind of traditional about that. <laughs> it shouldn't. Uh, when God made Adam, he, where did he take Adam from? Okay. Where did he take Adam from? The ground. Yeah. When he made Eve, where did he take Eve from? His from Adam, right. So they're oriented differently. Yeah, no, we're men. Yeah. yeah, women are oriented towards men. Men are oriented towards the ground. Yeah. Of course, they all end up in the ground eventually, but that's funny. That was supposed to be funny, but it's kind of morbid. Oops. All right, so then I'm just going to ask you questions. These are going to be easy. And you'll have, you know, you can keep this copy or I'll give you another one. Do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptism? Yes, I do. Yeah, and you can imagine if you were a, um, an eighth grader or sixth grader or something like that, um, for most of those that come to confirmation here, they were baptized as infants. They don't remember their baptism, right? That doesn't, we actually believe that baptism works even despite... Exactly. Thank you. You're saying what, what God promised me in baptism is true today. I believe it. Okay. I believe he baptized me and I was made a child of God. All right. So then the same questions that are asked at baptism, now you get to answer for yourself. Then your parents or sponsors answered for you. Okay. That's right. As an infant, right? Do you renounce the devil? Yes, I renounce him. Do you renounce all his works? Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways? Yes, I renounce them. So this all happens in, in our baptism, right? And this is true for anybody that baptizes infants. They all ask these questions. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? This time you get to say, yes, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Right? Apostles' Creed. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? In second article of the Creed. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Third article of the Creed. All right, so there's the confession of faith, right? Um, third to last question, do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God? And you say, I do. Do you know what that means? Prophetic and apostolic scriptures. All right. So let's break that down. What is that? Um, it is the Bible, but why prophetic and apostolic? Maybe the Old Testament. I think you're right. I think you're right. That means Old Testament, New Testament prophets like Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the other prophets all the way through, and then apostolic. Um, but, uh, inspired, that's a good word to learn and that you need to know. What does it mean that the word of God is inspired? Um, mm, yeah. Well, I mean, just what's the word literally mean? It's not expired. If you expire, what, what does that mean? You release? Yeah, you release your last breath. Right? Literally, it means spira is just breath. So you're, you're breathing out your last. That's an expiration. This is an inspiration, meaning it's breathed in. Yeah, yeah. So the Holy Spirit breathes into the apostles, the prophets, um, the evangelists, etc. his word, right? So that's what inspired means. Sometimes people say, I had an inspired thing. It means that a word came from outside you to you. Yeah, if you say you're inspired. Now, of course, different people will acknowledge that came from different places. Could be well, from your muse or from the, the fates, or we would actually say all inspiration comes from God. It's a gift from him. All right, next question. Do you confess the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran church drawn from the scriptures as you have learned to know it from the small catechism to be faithful and true? And you would say, I do. 
All right, so Evangelical Lutheran Church is a little confusing because there's actually a church body, a group of churches called the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And so people read this and say, wait a minute, I thought we were Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And like, huh. That's not what it means. It's unfortunate that it's all capitalized because then that makes you think it's a formal organization. It's not, we're not referring to the organization, we're refer- all the organizations, the way that we organize our churches. We're referring to the actual church. And evangelical means of the gospel. Lutheran means of the Lutheran confession and church. Um, of course, you can say you believe it because we took the time to learn it. <laughs> and hopefully you can say at this point, yeah, I believe what, you know. I mean, there's even from the Roman church, when we read the small catechism, there's so little to argue about. Um, maybe some minor quibbles about like the, the presence of Jesus in the supper. But like we didn't talk about like the power of the Pope or any. Eh. Although our church does. <laughs> um, so sometimes, this is a, always a caution. You're going to take that whole pot. Don't take that whole pot. Nice. You have to flip the little switch on the top to open. And then you can do some. Okay. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, yes. The catechism and like what you probably learned growing up, uh, catechism in a Roman church, um, isn't isn't as different as people think, and that's because we actually don't, we, we say that, that there's the, the Christian faith is taught in other churches. The difference being is that um, we would say there's also other things taught that aren't part of the Christian faith. So it's a, it's a mixture, and we don't want mixtures. We'd like you know things to be whole without extra stuff added. But not, I try not to do other things. If I do talk about like my political <laughs> opinions or whatnot, I try to say like like I care about currency a lot and money because God actually talks quite a bit about it and He wants us to avoid worshiping it. But I think then Christians maybe want to spend more time trying to fix the way that we handle money, like get rid of central banking, this kind of thing, so that it becomes less of a god to us, that it can like just get out of the way and we just have means of exchange that are reasonable, like bartering. Yes. You know, or something yes. like trying to use U.S. dollar just it Are seems we? to be a recipe for idolatry. But anyway, um, I try to keep it theological, but sometimes not. Anyway. All right. Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? And the answer is I do by the grace of God. Now, what does faithful mean? Depends on which way you want to go. Right. Like we talked about at the beginning. Three times a year. Yeah. If you want to go like thou shalt, thou shalt not. Luther said. Um, anyone who doesn't come to church at least four times a year shouldn't consider themselves a Christian. When, when he was pressed, somebody like, give us, a, give us a number, like bare minimum. He said four times a year. The Roman church has more than that. I think it's 12 or something. You have to go on certain feast days and things, right? Days of obligation is what they call it. If you want to go the law route, we can go the law route, <laughs> right? Like if you don't show up in a year, you're going to get removed from membership, all this kind of stuff. Um, but I'd rather go the other route. Faithfully means... I love to hear God's word. I want to receive the supper. I'll be there anytime that I can. And you define what can means, right? All right. Turn the page over. Do you intend to live according to the word of God in faith, word, and deed, to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? And I do by the grace of God. So by the grace of God is probably an important phrase, isn't it? It's like, can I remain faithful of myself? Do I have the resources to be faithful to God, even to death? The strength to do that, probably. By the grace of God. No, I don't. Yeah, I need the grace of God for that. Right. It has to be by God's giving. Mm-hmm. Um, so here we're talking about not only hearing God's word, but having that, letting that word have its way with you, that it would actually guide your life. So don't be surprised if you know something, especially if it's public, uh, and people are acknowledging. You know, Ali is uh, trying to think of something. You know. <laughs> well, you are your church secretary, so. You know, you keep, you know, I don't know, you keep stealing oh, copy. You, we'll say you keep stealing copy of paper or something. And people know yeah. about it, right? <laughs> that, don't be surprised if pastor says, cut it out. You know, thou shalt not steal, right? Mm-hmm. We live like Christians here. As best we can, not perfectly, of course. We're always under the forgiveness of sins, but we don't use that as an excuse for evil. Just because we're forgiven doesn't mean we keep sinning, right? Well, right. But on the same token, we don't ever say that, that Christians stop sinning <laughs> and that, right. that, that you can reach a state of perfection. We know that it's always both and, uh, and everything is under the grace of God then. All right. And then this one is the hardest question maybe. 
And so that's why it's the last one. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church? Notice it's capital C church. To suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it. I do by the grace of God. So confession is Apostles' Creed, Lord's Prayer, Ten Commandments, it's the Catechism. Uh, church, capital C church, doesn't mean this church necessarily. Not necessarily. It means, it means a faithful teaching church that has that confession. I, I'm not actually, I actually, this is going to sound terrible. I actually don't care what the name is on the church. I care what they teach. I know of, I know of Anglicans, Baptists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians that are closer to our confession of faith than some of the churches that even call themselves Lutheran, even in our own synod. So the name isn't the point. Uh, the, the point is the confession of faith. Um, the specific congregation isn't the point either, because you may move. Um, or the church. What? To, to give a simulation, I mean, the house doesn't necessarily. What you make of it is the home that makes it. Yeah. yeah, there's a difference between home and. I like the old word, hearth, if you remember yeah, home and hearth. And you can have, right. you know, Four wall cabin with everyone sleeps on the floor, but it's still your home. It's what you make. Right. It's what's inside. And this is a hard thing to learn. It's a hard thing, especially for people who've dedicated a lot of their life to this congregation, is that this congregation isn't the universal church, mm-hmm. now the church on earth. It it is. It's it's one of the places where God's church has been and is, but He doesn't promise that it'll be here forever. That's hard to hear, right? You're like, but I put so much effort in it. It's like churches come and go, congregations, I mean. But not the church, not the confession of faith, not Jesus. Yeah. So, like the churches that founded the Missouri Synod, the actual congregations in, Sa- in Perry County, Missouri. So the Saxons landed there. They founded all these churches in Perry County. They were farmers. Started um, when they moved there. There are other founding bodies elsewhere, Michigan, Iowa. But, but the ones in Perry County, Missouri, of all the churches in Perry County, I think one of them still exists that founded the Missouri Synod 180 years ago. Oh, really? Yeah, the rest are gone. All you'll see is like the front steps in the middle of a cornfield. <laughs> you know, that's it. And it's like, well, was that a failure? No. Right? The people that were parts of those churches, they their families moved to other churches. They started well, other churches. It was less same. Right. Like, and the church moves from place to place. Yeah. Like... Um, the Christian church once flourished in North Africa. Today, it's majority Muslim, which isn't good. We don't rejoice in that. That's obviously terrible. But the Christians moved. Mm-hmm. Other. So anyway, that's what we're talking about. Okay. Hence, capital C. So then, then we just again declare things that are already true. We rejoice with thankful hearts that you have been baptized and have received the teaching of the Lord. You've confessed the faith and have been absolved of your sins. You, as you continue to hear the Lord's word and receive the, his blessed sacrament, he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to the completion, to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's a, that's a blessing. It's declaring what's already true, and it's also speaking the promise of God, that he, you are his workmanship, and he's promised to bring you to f- completion on the last day. And that's his work. All right, and then another blessing on your head, each of you individually, and then I might give you a scripture text if you want one. Uh, if you haven't been confirmed before, you should get one. So I usually use those for your funeral or, or whatever pastor will. So whatever verse you get blessed with at your confirmation often becomes the funeral text, which is pretty cool because it connects you to your baptism and your confirmation to your, to your funeral. That's what I'm doing with Kelsey anyway. And then there's more prayers. So, and you can read those on your own. One other thing I wanted to show you, and then this will be it, I promise. Um, hi is the constitution of the congregation. You say, well, that's boring. It is. Um, but look specifically at, most of this you'll, you'll say, oh, I already, I already knew this. Um, but if you look at membership, Article 4, so it's on the second page, you'll note that communicant member, which is what we're talking about for you, uh, is just repeating the things that you just promised in the confirmation rite. Okay, so it's people are like, oh, those requirements are so strict. And it's like, wait a minute, did you? <laughs> you were presented for confirmation. When it's a young person, I get it, right? They don't really know what they're taking on, maybe. Um, it doesn't matter. So be baptized, declare your acceptance of the Old and New Testament, 
be sufficiently instructed in the scripture and the small catechism, lead a Christian life. We talked about that, right? Attend services faithfully, partake of the Lord's Supper. You said you would do that in the right. Submit for the sake of love and peace to all present and future rules and regulations of the congregation, provided that they don't conflict with the word of God. So you don't have to do what we say if it conflicts with God's word. And even if, and whatever. This doesn't generally, isn't a problem, but sometimes it is. Uh, permit themselves when they have erred to accept Christian admonition and correction. So that's just the preaching office. The pastor says, cut it out, you know, stop stealing the copy paper. Um, do not hold membership in any organization, secret or otherwise, conflicting with the word of God. That's a holdover from a previous time when people would go to church and they would go to the, they go to the lodge. The lodge. You don't know about the lodge? The Masonic Lodge, or the oh, the Mason Secret Societies. You know all about, you know all about secret societies.